Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Welcome to Gnosticism in the Mass. I'm Kellen Barber, and I'm giving this talk on behalf of Horizon Lodge, Ordo Templi Orientis. If you're interested in Thelema, OTO, or occultism and magic, please follow us on Facebook to find out about more events like this one. Since we're Thelemites in the 21st century, instead of Gnostics in the third, it's reasonable to ask why is Gnosticism important to Thelema? Or rather, why is Gnosticism important to me as a Thelemite? I'm not a Gnostic, and our world is very different than theirs was. Why should I care about this? In my opinion, the most obvious indication is that we celebrate the Gnostic Mass in the Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica, which means Gnostic Catholic Church. There are historical reasons for this, but if Gnosticism were irrelevant to Thelema, Crowley could have called it something else, for instance, the Thelemic Mass in the Thelemic Church. Another indication is found in the fourth article of the Creed of the Mass, where we say, And I believe in one Gnostic and Catholic Church of light, life, love, and liberty, the word of whose law is Thelema. This reiterates the connection between the law of Thelema and the Gnostic Catholic Church. This is from the fifth collect of the Mass. Here we see a list of Gnostic teachers and one Christian writer about Gnosticism who transmitted the light of the Gnosis to us, their successors, and their heirs. I think this last part is significant. We are not only the successors of the Gnostics, coming after them in a lineal succession but we have inherited something from them, the light of the Gnosis. By the way, this image is a statue of Mani, or Manes, the Gnostic saint, the founder of Manichaeism from a Manichaean temple in China that is now being used as a Buddhist temple. Even these few examples are sufficient to indicate that Gnosticism and Crowley's understanding of Gnostic ideas is relevant to Thelema, and in particular the mysteries of OTO, EGC, and the Gnostic Mass. So what is, or was, Gnosticism? Usually, when people speak of Gnosticism, they're referring to a set of religious movements around the Eastern Mediterranean in the early Christian era. But defining it can be a little bit tricky because it was not a unified movement and had no central authority or organization to codify its doctrines. There were various groups and individuals with various Gnostic ideas at different times and in different places, and they didn't always believe the same thing. But there were certain identifiable trends. Most Gnostics would have believed that the Creator God, referred to as the Demiurge, was not the real true God, and that the universe that we live in was created by some accident or by malice. Consequently, the universe was seen as evil, corrupt, or impure, something to escape from. They believed that a savior, often Jesus, had delivered some salvific knowledge to humanity, or the means to attain it, and by means of that knowledge, it was possible to return to the realm of the true God, our true home. But the Demiurge tries to keep us here through ignorance and other snares. Our knowledge of Gnosticism comes from a variety of sources, and we have much more available to us now than Crowley did. For a long time, one of the best sources about the doctrines of the Gnostics was Hippolytus of Rome, mentioned in the fifth collect of the Mass. But Hippolytus wasn't a Gnostic. He was a Christian theologian who was vehemently opposed to them. So not exactly an unbiased source. 
However, his work, Refutation of All Heresies, contains valuable descriptions of the doctrines of various Gnostic teachers. The Pistis Sophia is an actual Gnostic text, probably written between the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. In this text, Jesus has been teaching his disciples for 11 years after his death, until in the 11th year he assumes his final form and is able to impart to them new and higher mysteries. The Corpus Hermeticum isn't exactly Gnostic, per se. It's hermetic. I wanted to mention it here because there is some argument about how clear the line between Gnosticism and Hermeticism really is. Though it may not be Gnostic, it is certainly Gnosis adjacent. There are other lesser known texts, such as the Book of You, and there are a lot of physical artifacts of the Gnostics, in particular engraved gems. I find these very interesting, since they show the iconography of the various gods, which is useful for understanding them from a more esoteric standpoint. Finally, there are more modern finds, like the Nag Hammadi Library. The Nag Hammadi Library, in particular, is incredibly important for the contemporary understanding of Gnosticism, if for no other reason than its discovery provided so much additional material to work with. However, and this is important, Crowley would have never seen it. It was discovered in 1945, just a few years before Crowley's death, and it was published very slowly. So while it's tremendously important for a contemporary understanding of Gnosticism, it isn't helpful for an understanding of what Crowley thought of it. I'll just say now that I really don't think that the Lema is just repackaged Gnosticism. Some people do think that, and while there are similarities, I think there are enough differences that you can't really make that statement and have it be true in a meaningful way. For instance, while Thelema does have a concept of salvific knowledge attained through spiritual practice, knowledge of one's true will, there is no concept of another world for you to escape to, and there is no idea that this universe is corrupt. Also, if the Lema even has a creator god in any meaningful sense, that creator god certainly isn't evil. There is at least one important similarity between the Lema and Gnosticism that I'd like to point out, and that's that Thelemites don't always agree about everything. Far from being an indictment of the Lema or Gnosticism, I regard that diversity of opinion as a testament to the richness and depth of our tradition. I'm going to talk briefly about some Gnostic deities that appear in the Mass, or that you otherwise might find interesting. The first is Abrasox, or Abraxas, who is found in the system of Basilides. Abrasox is interesting because his name adds up to the solar number 365, and also because his iconography connects him with Iao. Like Iao, Abrasox often has the head of a bird, a human torso, and snakes for legs. He is further armed and carries a shield, symbolizing attack and defense. On this gem, from Bernard de Montfaucon's book, Antiquity Explained and Represented in Figures, we see him with these attributes and with the name Iao on his shield. On the reverse of the same gem, we see the name Abrasox, indicating that is the name of the figure. Another figure found in the mass is Mithras. Mithras was originally a Persian deity, but his mystery cult became very popular in Rome, especially among Roman soldiers. 
In the mass, Crowley uses the alternate spelling Mathros, adding an E between M and I, making the name enumerate to 365, which again makes the solar connection apparent. C.W. King, in The Gnostics and Their Remains, asserts that Mithros was occasionally found on gems with opera socks. I believe him. He had access to more of those than I do, but I have so far been unable to find any examples to verify this. But since this book would have been known to Crowley, I thought it was relevant to include Mithros here. This image is a tauroctony, a very common type of artifact found in Mithraic cult centers showing Mithras killing a bull and various other symbols. One figure who isn't mentioned by name in the mass, but who may nonetheless be interesting to Thelemites is the lion-headed serpent Knubis, seen here in this gem from the Getty collection. Knubis is interesting because his form recalls the serpent and the lion, which is the description of Baphomet given in the Creed. He is often shown in this position with his tail curled twice. It is also interesting to note that his name in Greek enumerates to 1,332. Finally, we come to Iao, who is uniquely important in both systems. As I mentioned before, the Gnostic Iao has similar iconography to opera socks, a bird's head, a human torso, often with armor, snakes for legs, and equipped with a shield and a weapon. The origin of the name Iao is unknown, though one theory common in Crowley's time was that it was a transliteration of the tetragrammaton yod he vav he I don't think it will be controversial to state that Iao is one of the most important names and formulae in Thalema. Crowley refers to it again and again, with different formulations and meanings in different places. I'm not going to go into great depth on these different versions of the name Iao, but it's worth it to mention some of them here. These all come from Chapter 5 of Magic in Theory and Practice. The interpretation of the name that people are most familiar with has the letters represent Isis, Apophis, and Osiris, respectively. Crowley learned this version from the Golden Dawn and uses it to represent different stages of the mystic process. The next formulation has I be the father, O the mother, and A their child. I believe that references to this can be found in the Gnostic Mass, the Book of Lies, and elsewhere in Crowley's work. At another interpretation, we see I, A, and O are all fathers balanced by the letters H, H, H. This is a reference to the combined name Aleph, He, Yod, He, Vav, He. And yet another formula, which Crowley refers to as the true formula of the beast 666, we find that I and O are opposites that form the field of operation for A. And there are, of course, others. This method of analyzing names letter by letter isn't particularly well attested prior to Crowley, but there is at least one relevant exception. In the 136th chapter of the Pistis Sophia, we find that Jesus gives this interpretation of Iao to his disciples. Iota, because the universe hath gone forth. Alpha, because it will turn itself back again. Omega, because the completion of the completeness will take place. This describes Iao as a formula of going forth and return, which in my opinion is refined in Crowley's formula of V I A O V. In chapter five of Magic in Theory and Practice, Crowley reformulates Iao as V I A 
o v spelled vav yod aleph ayin vav in hebrew to satisfy the new conditions of magic imposed by progress he also says that the word of the law being the lema, whose number is 93, this number should be the number of a corresponding mass. Crowley spends a good portion of chapter 5 of Magic and Theory and Practice describing this new name, and if you're interested, I recommend that you check that out. I'm going to focus on a portion of the table of correspondences he gives for the name seeing if we can extract a narrative that may shed light on the mass and its meaning. Here, I've selected some portions of the other column in Crowley's table of correspondences for this name that all either explicitly reference Parseval or can reasonably be inferred to do so. We start with V, where Parseval the child is in his widowed mother's care. Next is I, when the youth sets on his adventures after receiving the wand, followed by A, with Parseval as der reine Thor, the pure Thor, who knows nothing. After this comes O, Parseval in black armor, ready to return to Mont Salvat as Redeemer King, and finally the last V, Parseval as king and priest in Mont Salvat performing the miracle of redemption. I feel like I should mention that everything that comes after this point is my own work in progress and my own personal interpretation. I've been doing this for some time, so it's reasonably well informed, but I reserved the right to look back in a year or two and say that I was wrong. What strikes me about this especially given the going forth and return interpretation of EAO we get from the Pistis Sophia, is that it begins and ends with the same letter, V or Vav, which is to say in the same place. But though the protagonist, Parseval, has grown and changed, I think what's indicated here is that as this word begins and ends in V, so the priest begins and ends in the tomb, the life of a normal mortal human being. In the tomb, he is in the earth and the earthly life, his widowed mother's care. Shortly after leaving the tomb, he receives the wand, the lance, and starts on his journey. He becomes the pure Thor at the orations before the veil, invoking for knowledge, and is finally made ready to perform the miracle of redemption in the mystic marriage. He then completes it when he returns to the tomb, as Crowley writes in chapter 5 of Magic in Theory and Practice. Thus, he is a man made God, exalted, eager. He has come consciously to his full stature, and so is ready to set out on his journey to redeem the world but he may not appear in his true form. The vision of Pan would drive men mad with fear. He must conceal himself in his original guise. His original guise is the tomb, his natural earthly life. Thank you for watching as I've presented a summary of some Gnostic beliefs compared and contrasted Gnosticism with the Lema and made some suggestions as to how Gnostic ideas may inform our study of the Gnostic Mass. Please follow Horizon Lodge on Facebook and YouTube for more information on magic, OTO, and Thelema. Love is a law, love under will.